and different interests in the data. The, the kind of things they want to do with the data could be drastically different from each other, and the result could value my data differently, right? And so that's another piece of it. Um, maybe from the buyer's perspective, coming to buy my data is very difficult to verify what my data has and what authenticity and what, actual, uh, what content it has in it. Um, and uh, this externality, as I mentioned, is that um, you know two companies buying the same data sets uh, affect their utility. Okay. Um, and uh, just very quickly, I want to say that there are forms of digital markets out there. I mean, the stock market is a standard market that we understand, but we all have the ad auction market, which is an, a major, what, uh, 30 billion or something of the sort uh, per year market. I mean, to me, if you told me 10 years ago there is going to be an ad market that is uh, in the billions, uh, I would say you, you must be kidding, you know? But it is actually a gigantic market, and it's simple market because every time you open up a browser, someone is trying to buy that piece of real estate to push something to you. Someone is trying to buy it, but it's one real, uh, 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 real estate, one piece of real estate, and everybody is auctioning on it based on information about who opened the browser. Okay, and they do a second price auction, and so the person wins it. And when they win the, the piece of uh, land, they f figure out also using your data what to push on it to show you. Your click on it is what gets the process going in terms of who gets paid what. And I think that this is an, a very interesting market, the way it's been structured, where you, although it's everything about you, you're outside the picture. <laughs> you know? You're not even involved in that market. Your data is in the market, your decision is what gets everybody paid, and yet you're not in that market. Yeah? I mean, it seems insane. It's all about you, but you're not in the market, right? Um, the other thing that is interesting is the prediction market. I mean, think of that as a form of a digital market, but I think of it more as a crowdsourcing uh, way. You don't really go to the granular, granular level of data, but rather you look at what people decide and you collect different groups and you sort of make a prediction based on that. But there are different types of market. So here is the crux of the idea, and I, I'm going to try to end uh, with some comments. So I need maybe a few minutes uh, extra if that's okay. So the first revelation I think that uh, Anish had, and that was really interesting, is that buyers should never come to buy data. That's the wrong thing. Especially when you don't know what data you're buying. You don't know what it has in it. But buyers should come to the market interested in some sort of a prediction task. Some sort of a, a task that, they, that they're interested in doing, right? So we're gonna simplify that and say they're interested in a prediction task. They wanna predict something. So if you're a retailer, you want to predict the inventory in, in June. That's what you're interested in. And you come to the market with a whole bunch of numbers of what your inventory was or how much your, the demand was for June, and you ask the market to help you make that prediction. Okay? The, the seller, oops, sorry. Oh, great. That's what happens when you... Okay, the seller, on the other hand, um, the seller comes to sell data. That's what they're interested in. They want to make money on their data. They're not invested in the prediction task that the buyer has. They don't care, you know? They just want to make money on their data. They think they have good data and they want to sell it, you know? So there are two sides. The seller has data. The other person is coming to buy some prediction. The market is trying to figure out how to map data to this task and figure out how to compensate the seller for that mapping. One interesting thing is important for the buyer when they come into this market and they have a prediction task, is they need to have a valuation for the prediction of that task. That is, they should know that if they improve their prediction by 1%, this will give them X amount of dollars. This is really important because they otherwise don't know why they're asking for higher prediction. So if you're an inventory, you're looking at inventory, and you say, if I improve my inventory by 1%, I gain $10,000. That's a valuation, a linear valuation of, of this particular task, okay? So what the market has to do then, is has to make this work, has to make matching the seller's data to the buyers in a mechanism has to be done. So, so the market has to do everything. So what does the market have to do? Let me describe it here. Uh, it has to set up a mechanism where there's some uh, payment function 
that the buyers have to give for the data that they get that incentivize them to bid truthfully. So what's going to happen is that the market is going to say, it's a, it's a price mechanism. It's going to set some prices on the data. And then the buyer is going to come and bid. And based on the bid, they're going to get some of this data. The market is going to decide how to allocate the data to the buyers based on the bid. But you want a payment function that incentivizes them to bid truthfully. That is, they, they need to bid the, their valuation of the data. Yeah. They can. It's not what? Predictive? But it's, oh, it's not exclusive. It's not exclusive. Sold again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's right. In the most general setting, it can be sold multiple times to multiple buyers. Okay. Yeah, hold on. Let me just tell you, and then we, we'll, we'll have a whole discussion on this. I just want to tell you what you need to do, not what we've done. <laughs> and then we'll, uh, I can tell you what we've done, right? And so in, in a way, you need a mechanism that allows truthful bidding. It needs a mechanism that will collect a certain amount of money from the buyers and give it to the seller. But it also needs to divide that money among the sellers in a way proportional to the contribution to the prediction task. Not all the data contributed the same way, so they should get that money in proportion to their contribution to the prediction task. And they need to run this real-time market by updating the prices at every iteration, where every iteration is defined maybe as a bunch of buyers come in, buy, and they leave, and then a new set of buyers come in, and there's an update mechanism. And depending on the application, you may have to be able to, you may need to do this in milliseconds. And so all of this has to be convexified and computed and updated and, and so forth, right? So this is the story of a marketplace. I mean, this will take me another hour to tell you all the details of how to do this, and I don't have the hour. But I would say that at least, and we can discuss that a little bit after the talk, that in principle, this is a kind of a market where, um, well, that first of all, I would say that we have an in principle market that will answer many of these questions. But there's a lot of open questions to be dealt with as we go. Um, and it's basically the important thing, and the reason I'm presenting this is not to tell you what we've done, but to say that um, these markets are going to exist on top of other markets that are physical in nature. As I described, the electricity market is going to have a data market on top of it. The retail market is going to have a data market on top of it. The transportation system is going to have a data market. Because people that have the data that is deemed valuable are going to demand some compensation for contributing their data. Of course, money is one way to describe it, but the compensation could come in services and privileges and all of that stuff. But I need to feel that I've been compensated uh, faithfully and correctly for the importance of my data. I don't want you to take my data and make millions of dollars on it and give me $2, for example. That's a, that seems unfair. And uh, this is a space that is also growing, and it's growing actually in, in multiple different ways, but I would say mostly among economists and uh, computer science people, but I think it needs to be brought in closer to engineering questions as this, this aspect of data is, is very important to engineering questions. And it takes different, different ways, different uh, um, um, kind of emphasis. So what I described is one model where there is no probability or stochastics to the data, Everything is done in terms of numbers. When we talk about price update to maximize revenue, we use uh, regret, no regret algorithms, and so forth, right? But then you can think of uh, examples where the, the seller of the data has an investment in the prediction task itself that the buyer is coming in. So I'm giving my data for cancer research because I'm interested in the progression of cancer. That's a different type of a model. Um, I may also have uh, some valuation of privacy, so if the, if the compensation is not high enough, I will not contribute my data because I, I also have a, a cost of privacy. And then a third piece, for example, that has been done is looking at the feedback effect. So I sell my data to a company that sells it to a third company that sells me a product. Okay, and so now, my data, I got some money for the data, but the data resulted in a product that potentially I'm paying for uh, more money than the first one. And so this feedback effect can become an important piece, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this exists, but the question is it done in a way that is equitable, that I believe is, is right for me? Is there a, a sensible structure behind this market, or is it just, oh, they offer me an incentive and then I, they go and, and sell something else? So I want to conclude by saying, okay, uh, because we have, a, um, we have a college of computing coming up at MIT, so it's in our minds all the time, what, what is this whole thing, uh, how does it matter to think about computing in the future? So I thought maybe I will give you a very naive perspective and, and correction to what I talked about today. If you think about three decades, maybe a little bit more than that, I think the revolution in computing came from hardware. You know, the ability to, to have computers that can compute massive amount of simulation, and we've done massive amount of simulation of real systems on these, on these computers, and actually if you think about what the national labs have done, I mean, they have this exascale, and you can do a lot of complicated dynamics on these computers, but the innovation came from the hardware, and that was really critical at that time. If you think about a decade ago, primarily, I would say, Communication and networking, uh, and so the personal, you know, handheld computing and the distributed computing was the revolution. Now all of a sudden can compute. I'm w walking around with a computer. I'm connected to everybody. I can compute and I can communicate. And because I can compute and communicate, we have all these distributed tasks now that can be performed fairly well with certain algorithms and so forth, but also created a network question of how you know, my effect affects other people because I can communicate my effect and so forth. So we had, for example, the evolution of social networking and social data, which generated a whole bunch of interesting questions and, and, and definitely interesting research around this area. And this is actually still up and running. This is very vibrant as an area, but then I look at the third direction and what is that, and I would say this is the interaction of um, uh, computing and physical systems. I think this is where it's going to be critical, and the reason why I took you in this sort of what I call painful tour in my talk, um, uh, when you talk about physics, if you're talking about autonomous cars and you're talking about autonomous airplanes and autonomous drones and so forth, uh, these are all uh, safety critical systems. Uh, the importance of the integration of computing and, and physical part is really critical in making sure that the system will perform well, but most importantly is not hazardous, okay? Um, you know, uh, dropping packets or halting an algorithm uh, could be detrimental in an autonomous car just because the algorithm did not converge we hit the, the, the car in front of us. I mean, that, that is not acceptable. And so this integration is really the second, um, the third, I would say, revolution, or the third starting from three decades ago. So fragility and safety is really important. Understanding the value of data and value of information, this whole story about data markets, but also understanding information and the value of information and how you integrate information in your decision is really a critical uh, piece. You will be making decisions with little data in real time, in real time, you're not going to be able to train a neural network, okay? You can be training your network offline, but in real time, that's not going to happen. Decisions have to be made on small data, and the question is, do we have the capability to make decisions on small data? And hence my sort of pitch to you about thinking about approximation and robustness, right? So you are making a decision based on approximate model or approximate system, and you have a track of the robustness of that particular system. I'm not saying what we've done is the only way to do it, but I'm just giving you sort of um, uh, a direction, I would say, that is critical in the research. Um, uh, combining structure and non-structure is going to be very critical. And so with all, this is, I think, is crucial in the future of computing, which means that in many ways, the physical applications are going to be uh, playing an important component in the development of the field. More so than they did, I would say, um, in the last few decades. It's going to be very critical what you're looking at, what applications and so forth. And I think, as Sanjoy mentioned, that the Institute for Data and Systems and Society is one place where we're trying to actually kind of emphasize uh, the connection between physical systems, social behavior, and computing. And um, uh, I think it's a, a very fruitful area. Thank you. It's also true, yeah. Yeah.
So we're trying to mimic, the, that's why it's called artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> trying to mimic the living thing. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 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 let me. Uh, I didn't give you the whole spiel on this uh, problem, right? So I believe, right, right. So I believe uh, first of all that the right setting, and at least in Anisha's paper, uh, the buyer never gets the data. Buyer didn't come to buy data. The buyer came to buy accuracy. The buyer goes home with accuracy. It doesn't go home with data. That data set remains the ownership of the person who sold that data. Maybe it can reset it again in the same way, right? Buyer cannot resell data that they don't have. It's important. So in this creating this market, it's very important that the market acts as the intermediary, computes what is necessary for the for the uh, sorry the market yeah, computes what's necessary for the buyer. The data remains the ownership of the of the person who sold it. Yeah. So it is possible that the case that um, it's important to contribute our data in order to uh, get some benefits, and so as a result, we are paid by these benefits. So that's one way to think about it. Um, and and in that particular case, potentially the market, um, you know, would not be successful, right? Yeah, right. There's always a benefit, right? I, I guess what we're trying to do is capture the benefit for you to participate in that dialogue. Is it goes offline? Yeah, yeah. Is it? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> I can resubmit. <laughs> Thank you very nice talk. Okay, thank you.